Sadhu Sundar Singh, With and Without Christ, Chapter 1, Non-Christians Without Christ. Though Christians and non-Christians are equally the creation and sons of one God, yet there is a great difference between them. Some men have a true knowledge and realisation of him and are transformed into his likeness and become the heirs of life and eternal happiness through living in the presence of his incarnation, Jesus Christ. Others, walking in the dim light of the truth as they know it, and following the desires of their own wills, stray from the truth and deprive themselves of the blessings that are to be found in Christ. The difference in the lives of those with and without Christ can be seen from the examination of the incidents which we now present. It is a well-known fact that in those lands where the gospel has been widely preached, a noticeable change in thought has taken place, even though comparatively few have become professed followers of Christ. While the state of those countries where the gospel has not been preached is little different from what it was in former days, when they were counted as uncivilised and altogether superstitious. Witness The word of God tells us that all men are sons of God because he is the same to all and is no respecter of any. It says that in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is acceptable to him. Acts 10.35 And it also says that he left not himself without witness. Acts 14.17 The light of the truth which God revealed was sufficient to lead the nations back to him. But it was not that full light of truth that was afterwards revealed in Christ, the Son of Righteousness. Malachi 4.2, John 1.9 Now that the light of the world has come, conditions have changed. For those that are real seekers after truth have begun to follow him in that light, while others, whose eyes are blinded by self, have turned away from him and walk in darkness. John three nineteen to twenty one. Unless man's search for truth satisfies the craving of his religious nature, he can find no rest. For when his conscience is awake, try as he may, he can never stifle its intense longing. Only those who, by deliberate neglect of God, have deadened the craving of their hearts and silenced the inner voice, can know any degree of peace but it is the peace of death. Let us now try to find out how far those without Christ have succeeded in allaying this craving of their souls for rest. A bed of spikes. Some time ago in Hardwar, I saw a sadhu lying on a bed of spikes. I went to him and asked, what aim have you in wounding and torturing your body in this way? He replied, Don't you know that much when you yourself are a sadhu? It means austerity and the mortifying of the flesh. I worship God in this way, but I confess that the pricks of these spikes are not so bad as the pain I get from my sins and evil desires. My object is to crush the desires of self that I may gain salvation. I asked, How long have you been doing this, and how far have you succeeded in your objective? He replied, I began this 18 months ago, but I have not yet gained my object, nor is it possible to do it in so short a time. Many years, and indeed many births, will be necessary to accomplish it. Then I told him of my own experience of failure when I tried to gain salvation by my own efforts, and of how, in an instant, the Lord Jesus changed my heart and calmed my restless soul with that true peace, to gain which he was expecting to torture himself through many rebirths. And I added, If in this present birth you cannot be successful, then what proof have you that you will gain it in any future birth? Now, not because I am in any way worthy or have any right, but by his grace and mercy, I have been freed from the pricks of my sin and evil desires and temptations and have yielded myself up to him who can take away not only my sins, but the sins of the whole world. John one twenty nine. 
For, as the spikes have pierced the hands and feet of that sinless one on behalf of sinners, so now, by his sacrifice, we are saved from sin and its consequences. When he heard this, he made no attempt to argue, but said, I can never admit that salvation can be obtained as a free gift and in one short life. How difficult it is for those who have had no experience of this life in Christ to understand it or to admit that it can be true. Hanging head down. Then I saw another ascetic who, with a rope tied round his feet, was being swung about from a tree with his head downwards. I went away and after a while returned when he had been untied and had rested. I asked him what motive he had and what profit there might be in trying such austerity. He said, I do not feel like saying anything just now, but as you are a brother sadhu, I will explain my motives in a few words. Think for a moment why people are so amazed when they see me hanging head down, when the Creator himself has hung all mankind upside down in their mother's wombs. Well, this is the manner in which I perform my worship and my austerity. In the eyes of the world it is foolishness, but by acting in such a way I want to remind myself and all men that, when we entangle ourselves in our sins, we turn ourselves upside down in the sight of God, even though in the eyes of the world we appear to be right side up. I want also to keep on outwardly and inwardly reforming myself until I am satisfied that at last I am right side up before God. I replied, You have strange ideas. It's true the world is upside down and its ways are also upside down, but we should not adopt their upside down ways of doing things. How can we, by our own efforts, free ourselves from the entanglements of sin? It is a task beyond our strength. Hence, the Lord of love became man, that he might set us free from our bondage. Luke 4.18 And to set the world aright, he uses as his instruments those whom he has saved and set free. Acts 17.6 At this, the sadhu gave a sign that he did not wish the conversation to continue, so I rose and came away. One thing is quite certain. In spite of the horrible austerity he was undergoing, he had not as yet been able to effect any such reformation in his life as to give him either satisfaction or peace. Without hope. After this, I met another ascetic who, in the hot weather, used to sit all day long between the five fires while in the cold weather he used to stand for hours in cold water. On his face, sadness and hopelessness were expressed. I had with me another man who asked him with great sympathy, You've been torturing yourself in this way for the last five years. Will you give me some idea of why you, what you have learned from this manner of life? What good have you got from it? The sadhu replied, I have no hope for any kind of benefit in this present life, and I can say nothing at all about the future, and that is all I can tell you about it. A Withered Hand Once, when I was spending a few days in the jungles of Rishikesh, in which many sadhus live, I saw a great many people sitting round a sadhu seated on the bank of the Ganges. The sadhu had one hand raised above his head, and from a distance I thought he was giving his blessing to the people. When I came near, I saw that the bones of his arms were set so that he could not lower it. When he had finished his talk with the people, I asked him how his arm had become dried and fixed. He gave his reply with the great pride of one who had overcome an enemy in battle. Sir, he said, with this hand I have stolen much and have beaten many, but there came a day when I had such a great shock that the foundations of my whole life were shaken. I left my old life altogether and decided I would either cut off this hand or, by making it useless, give it the punishment it deserved. I consulted my guru, and on his advice I held it up continuously above my head till it had completely dried up and become fixed in this position. Now I am very proud of it. I replied, I admire your courage and your good intention, but I am sorry, for you have been spoiling a gift given you by God. Instead of destroying your hand, you should have used it in helping others. 
In this way, to some extent, you could have made good the loss you had caused by it. Real courage and victory consists not in uselessly destroying your hand, but in using it to help others. My guru, Jesus Christ, said, If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Matthew 5.30 And his meaning is that we should so cut out from our hearts the instrument of evil, that in future it should never again be available for such purpose. I had barely finished speaking when he jumped at me in such a rage that there is no doubt had his hand been of use he would have struck me. Afterwards I respectfully pointed out to him how useless it was for him to have mutilated himself. It would have been better had he changed the intentions of his heart, which was behind the hand, so that it might now move to fulfil God's purpose in his life. Vows of Silence the next day I went to see another man, whom the people called Moni Bawa, a sadhu who had taken a vow to remain silent for a number of years. This man was a real seeker after truth. For the last six years he had not uttered a word. He wrote on a slate the answer to any question I asked him. One of my questions was, Why do you not make use of this God-given gift? For he has given you the tongue for speaking, for glorifying and worshipping him and for giving advice on spiritual matters. If God had intended you to remain silent, he would have created you a dumb mute, and would not have given you a tongue. Without any show of pride, he wrote his answer. What you say is quite true, he wrote, but my temper is so bad that no good ever came out of my mouth. I used to lie and say things to hurt people's feelings. It is nearly six years now since I last spoke, but as yet I have not gained my objective. It is better to be silent than not to speak good words. Thus far, no blessing has come to me, nor any special message for the people, so silence is best for me. I talked a little longer with him and then gave him a gospel, which he accepted thankfully and promised to read carefully. <laughs>